in church. Can you help me turn to your neighbor and just say hi to them? Welcome them one more time. <clears throat> Are you happy that you're in the house of the Lord? Is there something that you're grateful to God this morning? If there is, um, we thank God for that. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful this morning for your grace and love. We've just been singing some songs to you, Lord, because there's so much, Lord, Father, that we are grateful for. And we recognize you, Lord, as king in our lives, in our families. Lord, we would not be where we are right now without you. We thank you for the amazing grace that has brought hope to us, that has given us hope for the future. Lord, knowing that you are in step with our lives and everything that goes around us, Lord, we thank you that this morning you've given us an opportunity to come together as a family of God's tribe, to worship you, to praise you, but also to hear your word. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us this morning. Pray that, Lord, you would prepare every heart to be a fertile ground. That as your word comes, Lord Father, it will find a heart that is ready to receive. And I pray that our minds will be alert. I pray that, Lord, that the enemy will not steal your word from us by bringing in other things in our minds, Lord, as we, we hear your word. We pray that this word this morning, Lord, will transform us, will change us, will make Christ to be real in our lives, in our families, and in everything that we do. I pray that, Lord, you give me the confidence. Help me, Lord, Father, to speak your word clearly. And I pray that our hearts will be and our minds will comprehend all that there is in your word this morning for us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, welcome again. Um, may I just ask you to stand up for a while and we read our our memory verse for the year. One, two, three, let's go. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being a cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Amen. Thank you. You may take your seat. So as you realize, from the beginning of this year, we have been uh, taking on a, um, a series on building up. And uh, we are now moving towards the end of the year. And a couple of weeks ago, Arthur started with a, a sermon entitled Pursuing Love. And uh, last week, Joe spoke on the love that pursues. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the ministry of reconciliation. And we want to see how all this fits together when we talk about love. And as I told you before, one thing that you will expect to hear from my mouth whenever I stand here is about the love of God. Amen. How many of you want God to be in love with you so deeply? So deeply. Can you just raise your hand? If you really feel, you want to feel like God loves you than anybody else in the world. Yeah, so I think I'm in a good place. Hallelujah. Yeah, so our reading is going to come from 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 from 17 to 21. So if you have your Bible, you can uh, pull it out as we read a couple of verses this morning and then we'll see what God has for us this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to read from verse 17 through 21. So I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, in Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be seen for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. So, if you look at these verses that we've just read, one of the words that stands out is the word reconciliation, and I think it appears five times in just those few verses. But that's not only where that word reconciliation appears in the Bible. It appears several in also several passages in the Bible. But specifically, we're going to be focusing to these verses that we have read here, or this chapter in uh, Second Corinthians. One of the things that I've been uh, seeing or hearing over time in church, that in Christianity today there is a lot of emphasis on getting things from God. Most of our sermons that we hear out there or things that, the sermons that excite people is when they hear that God is blessing them this year. God is blessing you with a job. God is blessing you if you're single with a, a husband. If you're married and you have no children, you, you want to hear the sermon that talks about how God can give you a child. And we want God to do something for us all the time in our prayers. And actually, our prayer life is full of requests. Our prayer life has turned to request. In fact, today, when people talk about prayers, most times it's associated with requests or prayer requests. What can we get from God? What do we want God to do for us? God is only important to most of us when we need Him to do something for us. And you can see how people really go so much into prayer or studying the word because there's something that they want God to get them out of. When we have a need in our family, then God becomes important. When our finances are going down, then God becomes important. When your children are behaving in a certain way, now God becomes important. We begin now to go really into fasting and praying. Even sometimes really dwelling into the Word, now studying the Word. We're not studying the Word because we're really in love with the Word, but because we want God to see that we deserve Him to do something about the situation that we are going through. The moment something is going wrong with our marriage, that's when God comes in in the scene. And I've been asking myself this question most of the times. That do we relate with God only to get him to do something for us? Is that all there is that a believer, a Christian in God has? That we can only turn to him when we have needs, we have problems, we have things that are not going right. This morning, allow me to draw your attention to two powerful words that verse 18 and verse 19 teach us. And I think Paul put a lot of emphasis in these two verses on the importance or the purpose of a believer 
here on earth. The reason why God has left you to up to now here on earth, I think, falls into these two verses in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and verse 19. And that's where my focus is going to be in today's sermon. I know most of you might be uh, saying right now that, hey, why is he jumping verse 17? Because I know that might be your favorite verse. Verse 17 is a, a favorite verse for many people, and I think most people haven't memorized that verse, verse 17. So, for the sake of those who really love it, we'll just read it one more time, but that's where not my emphasis is going to be today. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's our favorite verse. And most of the times, that's where we end. And we go around looking at ourselves as new creations. We see ourselves as people who are new now in God. But this morning, I want us to notice something in verse, 17, in verse 18 and verse 19, where most of my emphasis is going to be in these few minutes that are remaining. In verse 18, it says, All things, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So, only in that, first, in that verse you can see clearly that we are reconciled people. We have been reconciled to God, and that's my first point in this sermon this morning. We have been reconciled. We have been reconciled by God himself through Christ. How did this happen? It says in verse 19, if you go to verse 19 a little bit, it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus entered to a world to end the conflict, to restore unity between God and a sinner. As we all know that what the consequence that Adam brought to humanity, Adam and Eve when they sinned, there was a, bro a, there was a broken relationship between man and God. There was an enmity, there was hostility between God and man because they rebelled. They never hearkened to what God has, had instructed them. So the term reconciliation simply means to bring back to a former state of harmony. And that's what Christ did. And this verse clearly shows us that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So if you're a believer, if you're that person that knows that you are now a new creature, what really happened is that God was in Christ. He did all the work. All this is from God. He did all the work to make sure that he brings back all humanity to himself or in harmony with him. In other words, Jesus dealt, Jesus' death and resurrection made reconciliation possible. Amen. And uh, we can also see that in uh, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 10. He says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in, the, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he says in verse 10, for if, okay, verse 9, verse 9 says, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So, we are reconciled people. God has reconciled us to himself. And his son is the foundation of this reconciliation. God is not counting or charging humanity again with uh, their sin. He has paid a price through his son's death on the cross. 
And now he's offering forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus. So we are reconciled people. That's what we can clearly see in this verse. Amen. Christ removed the obstacle that stood between every person and God by paying the price of each believer's sin with his own death. Again, in the same verse, we see the other thing we see, he has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now notice, we have been reconciled to God through Christ, and now we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Willard has just given an announcement about evangelism, and I think that's the place where right now we are putting so much emphasis in this church. And to some person may not see it as something really serious, but that's something that is at the center of God's heart. Evangelism, witnessing, sharing this good news with others. And as a church, we are really moving towards that, to see that we become a church that is really moving in line or in step with what God really is calling us to do. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more later on. God has reconciled us and made us ministers of reconciliation. You don't need to have a vision. You don't need Jesus to appear to you to know that you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. This is something that comes with a package as a, as a new creature, as a new creature in Christ. It comes as a package. God is calling every one of us to be his ambassadors, to be ministers of this uh, this message of reconciliation and I want to bring to our attention that the original ministry of every believer is the ministry of reconciliation I know some people might be here you're trying to pray and fast to try to figure out what is God calling you to do what is my ministry maybe you've been in church for many years and you're trying to figure out what is my ministry I've met so many people that are asking how can you know that this is what God is calling you to do. But if you read this verse, you realize that every believer has been given already a ministry. And that's the ministry of reconciliation. A ministry of showing people, telling people about God's love. And his plan to redeem, his plan to save, his plan to mend the, the relationship which was broken. That's the ministry that God has given to each one of us. And I don't know how many of us are really doing it. How many of you are grateful that you have been reconciled to God? How many of you? Like I'm really asking, how many of you are really happy that you, you are happy that you've been reconciled to God? You, you, will, you will forgive me today because you will be communicating. Today I will not want a lot of amens because I know there might not be a lot of amens, but I'll be asking you to raise your hand. Amen? Okay, amen also is still there. Thank you. And how many of you are experiencing impact, the joy, the peace, the hope that comes along with that reconciliation that you have with God now? My question to you, are you actively, are you actively doing what God expects you to do or to be doing with the ministry that he has given to you. You may not raise your hand, but I want you to think and digest it. Are you doing what God expects you to do or to be doing with the ministry that he has given to you? Because if you are experiencing the impact of it, you're experiencing the joy and the hope that now you have in God because you've been reconciled to him, then that should move you. That should be a thing, a force behind that moves you towards doing what God has called you to do. If you are not doing it, do you wish that no one else gets a chance or an opportunity to hear about what God has done for them? If you're not doing it, if you're not bothered about doing it, are you not concerned that somebody else will miss an opportunity, will miss a chance 
to be reconciled to God. And you and me know what that means. The consequence of the consequences that are attached to that. If somebody is not reconciled to God, we know exactly what is going to happen to them. Are you not concerned? Are you not concerned about that? Do you know that if you don't do your ministry that God gave you, many people will miss the opportunity. And if they miss that opportunity, that means that they are heading to hell. And some of those people, they are your relatives. Some of those people, they are your bosses in, in the office. Some of those people, they are your own children. They are your aunties, your uncles, your neighbors. That most, most of the times we invite them when we have a wedding. We invite them when there's a party. We invite them in all other events except to tell them about reconciliation. That God wants to reconcile them. And God has planned, has designed a way of reconciling them back to him. We are willing even to pay for some of them to attend the event. But since this year started, how many of us have just even taken time to invite somebody who knows nothing about God or who are not even concerned about just to invite them to come to church? How many of us have done that? From the beginning of the year, we are ending October right now, we are remaining with two months to end the year. How many of us since this year started has taken time to share with somebody about God's love because right now I think even when Love Dark campaign ended ooh, we clap our hands oh we are done let's wait if it happens next year or if it happens after two years from now that's when again we will think about it the Bible tells us that we have been given a ministry that ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And all of us know that if so when someone gives you something, you become responsible and accountable for it. If somebody commits something to you, you become responsible and accountable to it. Now, some of you might be listening to me and say, hey, Tony, you're taking this thing too far. You're just, you're in a rush. Take it slow. I have been told that before, and I've never been able to take it slow. When it comes to my ministry of reconciliation, I cannot take it slow. Ah, Tony, are you a pastor? Are you a bishop or something? Why are you taking this thing too far? You're doing it as though Jesus is coming back tomorrow. You're doing as if you want to take this thing to Olympics. Don't you know that the Bible really tells us to take this thing to Olympics, to World Cup? Do you think that we, God wants us to do our ministry just locally and end it there? No. We have to take it to World Cup. That's what Matthew 28 tells us. It says, until the end of the earth. So it's not something that we are going just to do it reluctantly. It's not something that we are going to, to wake up to think, oh, there is this because there is love that campaign. Look at Paul. See how Paul understood his ministry. Acts 20, from verse 22 to 24. He says, I see now, now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that might happen to me, except the Holy Spirit testifies every in every city saying that the chains and tribulations await for me but none of these things move me nor do I count myself dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God he says, the, the, this, the Holy Spirit was telling him, when you go there, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be, this and this is going to happen to you. But he says, none of these things. None. They don't move him. 
Why? Because he knows he has a ministry that he has received from Jesus. And because he has been given that ministry, he has a responsibility to finish. He has, he has to account for it. He will give an account for that. So he says, none of these things scare me. None of them. Fulfilling your ministry is more important than anything that you are doing now for your retirement. I don't know whether you are aware about that. Because anything that you're doing right now ends here. Anything that you're doing ends here. It doesn't matter how many millions of shillings of dollars that you will accumulate. They end here. But do you know that if you have one soul that you help to come to Christ, that you're going to spend eternity looking at the profit that you, you had? Sometimes I look at people like Bonky. He's not here anymore. But can you imagine somebody who shared the gospel with Bonky? Can you imagine a person who shared the gospel with Maurice Seluro? Maybe had a sermon like this. And then they went and began sharing. Now, look at the work that those men did. Just because somebody obeyed God, somebody accepted to do his ministry. And that's what happens if today you and me will hearken to the voice of God and decide to do it. Now, pull up your, your, your phone if you have a calculator. I want to ask us to do something, to check out something. I can see we are roughly maybe 100 and something right now seated here. But I want us to take it for average that if we are 100 people, 100, only 100, 100 people who decide to say, I'm going to only win one saw per month and disciple that saw. In 12 months, how many people are those? 12 times 100. How many? 1,000? 1,200. That means if we are only 100 of us this morning, who will hearken to the voice of God about the ministry that we have been given, and then we determine that from January next year, I will be winning souls. I'll go and do my ministry, and I want only to win one soul per month and disciple that person. In a year, you'll have 12 people. And if we are 100 of us, we'll be meaning that in one year, this number is going to be 1,200 people. What about if 1,200 disciple 12 people, each one of them, in a year? How many? 14,000? Now, that's what the Bible talks about in the book of Acts, how the church multiplied. They were not in addition. They were not doing addition in their ministry because they took their ministry serious. You would hear the first sermon, there were 3,000 that came to Christ. And the Bible says in the next week, almost 4,000 were added. If you read Acts of Apostles chapter 2, from verse 37 and going forward, it says 4,000 were added the next week. Not after a month, the next week. Why? Because these guys understood the ministry that God called them to do, and they did it. Brothers and sisters, there are people out there on the streets that will never come to Christ unless you open your mouth and speak to them about Christ. And if you don't do that, they are going to head to hell. That's where they're going to end. But you know what? The Bible is clear. You have been given a ministry, that means you have a responsibility, and you will be accounted for that. God has commissioned each one of us to share with others his message of love and peace. We must open wide our hearts, allowing God to compel allowing God's compelling love to flow through us to others. This ministry is a big resp responsibility.
In verse 19, he talks about as though God is making an appeal through us. God is making an appeal to accomplish what he has, what he started. The ministry that you have been given is urgent. It's a matter of life and death. So if we're not going to do it, people are going to die. But God will be asking himself, why should he keep you more any longer here? Because I think the reason why believers, when we get born again, we become new creatures, God leaves us here is because he has a ministry that he has for us to do. My third point is he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The message of reconciliation. Now you notice that after God has reconciled us, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he did not end there. He also gave us the message the message that we need to take out there. So it's not something that you have to figure out. I have a ministry, but I don't know what am I going to tell people. He gave you the message. He gave us the message. We have the message that he has given us. Verse 19 again, it says, That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the, the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. He has given us the word of reconciliation. Our message is to the world. Our message to the world is that God is not holding people's sins against them. As far as God is concerned, Christ's sacrifice paid the penalty of all sins. So it's a matter of us now hearkening to God's voice and going to tell them, hey, God is not mad at you. And we are planning to do in this church something. Actually, what I've said about 100 people, we are planning to do it. We're not going to force people to do it, but we are, I know there are people who, are, who will be willing to do it. We are going to emphasize more on training, our, uh, doing our discipleship programs, whereby we will need at least 100 people that will commit themselves and will give you a form to fill. If you don't want to do it, leave it, don't take it. But if you want to try it, if you want to obey God and do it, we'll give you a form to feel that I'm going to commit myself every month to share the gospel with at least one person and disciple them. And if you need help, leaders are going to be there to help you. Hey, on Friday, I want to go out, but I don't know how to do it. Can you come, Tony, and go with me out? I'll be willing to come. Willard will be willing to come. Arthur will be willing to come. There are people who already, who already and have understood their ministry and they are willing to do it. We are, we are prepared to work with people that are willing to do the ministry that God has given to them. And watch at the end of the year when you look back and see the people that God has used you to touch. In verse 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. That's our message. When you go to the street, the only message you have said, be reconciled. God loves you. Come back. God is calling you back. He has already done everything. Come, repent, accept, embrace. It's as simple as that. So the Bible says that we are ambassadors of Christ. How many of us believe that we are ambassadors of Christ? 
Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine? The president of this country, Samia Sluhasan, she appoints you today that you are an ambassador to the US. How would you feel? How would you feel inside you? You're going to prepare for a party and invite all your friends to tell them that now you're an ambassador. Because already in your mind, you know, your children, children's schools are going to change. The package that comes with that, um, uh, that position, you know the kind of house that you're going to be living in. You know the privileges when you go to the airport that you have a different line to stand in. But that's just a mere person that is picking you to be an ambassador to a certain country. But also, can you think about it if they, you accepted that appointment, then you went to the U.S., and then you sat inside with your family and enjoyed, ah, I'm afraid I can't tell somebody anything about in the U.S. I can't do anything because I'm afraid. I'm just an ambassador, but I'll be here. And say nothing. Because... The president sends you there to represent she or him in that country and represent the country that you're coming from in that specific nation. There are things that you're expected to do. But you know what? We here, ambassadors, I meet some of you and say, I'm afraid. I don't even know what to say. Can you imagine if an ambassador went to the U.S. and said, I'm afraid, I don't want to say Just imagine, I'm afraid, I don't know what to say. I even don't know what people will think about me. I don't really think that they will listen to me because I'm just from Tanzania. But that's exactly, that, that's exactly what, we, what we say. We fear to be rejected. We fear that if we go out there, people will reject us. We don't know what people will think of us. And because we don't really believe what we read in, our, in the Word. Whatever is in this Bible, we read it, it's just theory. We really don't believe that what God said is true. That behold, I will be with you, present. I will be there to empower you. I will be there with you to the ends of the earth. So when he sends you, he doesn't just send you. He gives you the message and then he has promised you his presence. What are you going to do with this message today? I know there are two things. First one is to just leave it. It is just Tony who said, ah, don't take him for serious. But another person will say, I want to break out of my fears. I want to obey God. I want to take my ministry serious. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to begin to do it. And then watch how God is going to empower you to do it. I, I remember I've prayed for people in the hospitals and when I pray for them is when they die. I think like about three or four of them. I was invited to the hospital and I prayed for them. I prayed with all my energy. I wanted them, I wanted the power of God to, you know, to show up and that person should leave and then they died. Then I prayed for another and they died. But let me tell you, I've experienced the power that sometimes I look at myself, did it go through me or what? When I'm doing evangelism, I have experienced seeing somebody who was blind, eyes opened, just like that, not after tomorrow, just like that. So if you want to experience God's presence, just go and do this ministry. After this service, we're going to be having a training for evangelism.
just simple steps that you can use. Simple steps that you can use. But also, on 16th of November, we are going to do corporate outreach, the whole church, we're going to move. Again, we're not going to force you to do it because we are not the ones who gave you the ministry. The one who gave you the ministry will follow it up. But I plead with you that let's be a church that is obedient. Let's be a church that moves together. You see right now what I'm talking about, if it was something in the world and someone says, hey, you want to do this? I tell you they will come, all of them. All of them will show up. Except in church. Like I said, I don't know even after finishing this service how some people are going to be looking at me. He was, he was rude when he was saying it. He was harsh. Or, or I don't know. Let's pray. Can you just take a minute just to pray? Father, I, I thank you for this day and I thank you for every person that is in this room. I know that many of us, Lord, are willing to obey you. But the devil puts fear in us. Because he knows exactly that when we stand in line with what you've called us to do, that your name will be glorified. Father, I pray this morning that you help us to be doers of your word, not just listeners. I pray that your word will not be just theory in our ears, but people who are practically doing what your word says. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you minister to us even after this Sunday morning. That Christ's voice on that cross that said it's finished will resound again in our minds. And as that sound comes, Lord Father, that we will notice and know that Nobody deserves to go to hell because Christ, Christ's work on the cross finished, paid the price in full for every creature, for every person, human on this planet earth. That Lord, you've given us this ministry so that we can announce the ambassadors, Lord, that will go out there and tell people that, hey, God is not mad at you. God wants you. He has designed a way out where you are. I pray that, Lord, our hearts be encouraged this morning, be lifted and empowered by your Spirit, Lord, to obey you. Let this be a priority in our lives, Lord. Thank you so much, Tony, for such a wake-up call and a sober reminder for our ministry of reconciliation to do evangelism every single day. So just quickly, I would like to hand over to Arthur for one more announcement.